first problem I'm going to work through is that of a sphere of permeability mu placed in an otherwise uniform magnetic field. magnetic field both inside and outside the sphere. Now let's first write down the boundary conditions. There's a discontinuity in the normal component of the H field, and that's equal to minus the discontinuity in the magnetization vector. There's a discontinuity in the tangential component of the H field, and that's equal to the surface current density crossed into the normal. Now, uh, B is simply proportional to the H field, and because there's no current, there's no free current here, bottom boundary condition just becomes the tangential component is continuous. What about the other one here? Um, as it turns out, it's actually more convenient to write this in terms of the magnetic field rather than um, introducing some magnetization vectors. So in other words, it is true. that the normal component of the magnetic field is continuous. Now we also know that H is equal to minus the gradient of some magnetic scalar potential, so therefore inside B is equal to minus mu times the gradient of the magnetic scale of the potential and outside B is equal to minus mu naught times the gradient of the magnetic scale of the potential. So we have mu naught outside and mu inside. Because there is no um, current density, and because the magnetic field has a simple relation, this is a simple constituted relation between the magnetic field and the H field, the Laplacian of the magnetic scalar potential equals zero. Therefore, we can just use all of those tools that we used back in electrostatics. So we're talking about a sphere here, so therefore, uh, that also has azimuthal symmetry, so therefore the magnetic scalar potential can be written as the summation L equals zero to infinity, some coefficient a sub l times r to the l plus some coefficient c of l, r to the minus l plus 1, and times the Legendre polynomial PL cosine theta. And notice here, the difference between this, the way I've written this, and previously is that I call this b, but I don't want there to be any confusion between these coefficients and the magnetic field. So that's why I'm calling them c. OK. 
Okay, so what other conditions do we have on our system? Well, told that the magnetic field is otherwise uniform. So that means as you get very, very far away, as R approaches infinity, the magnetic field is just going to go as B naught and Z direction. And we are choosing our applied magnetic field to point in the Z direction. Let's consider the interior solution first. Now this solution has to remain finite as R goes to zero, so that excludes the possibility of having any of these C sub L terms. So therefore, generally speaking, inside solutions L equals zero to infinity, A sub L, and I'm going to put a little superscript plus and indicate that those are the coefficients that pertain to the interior solution, uh, times R the L times PL cosine theta. Outside, we're going to have these terms, because I know those will go to zero as R approaches infinity. And I'll put a greater than superscript to indicate that those coefficients pertain to the exterior solution. So all of the corresponding CLs set to zero so solution remains finite. And you might think to yourself, well, we can eliminate all these A sub L for the same reason. However, your magnetic field has to go as B naught, it's otherwise uniform. So that means you're going to have one surviving term from this potential number, um, infinite number of terms. So we'll write this as, um, because this goes as B naught, that implies that your scalar potential is going to go as minus B naught R cosine theta over mu naught. And basically, yeah, that's actually just it's easier to see that if you just write as minus B naught Z over mu naught. Remember, Z is equal to R cosine theta if I just write that in. Cartesian coordinates. So therefore, if I take the gradient of the magnetic scale of potential, that is going to be equal to minus B naught over mu naught. So let me just write it up here. H is B minus scale of potential. So this is R goes to infinity. This is going to be B naught over mu naught in the same direction, but it is B that we are interested in, so therefore B is going to go as B naught C. Okay, so your scalar potential um, is going to go as minus B naught over um, R cosine theta over mu naught. So therefore, the one surviving term from this possible infinite number of terms is going to be A sub 1 R cosine theta. Okay? And I'll pull a greater than sign there to indicate that we are talking about the coefficient pertaining to the exterior solution. Okay, so I might as well just go ahead and substitute this in right away um, because I've already determined what A1 has to be. So this is equal to phi star to compare this asymptotic um, solution basically. And with this one, let's see, this is actually equal to minus b naught r cosine theta over mu naught. Now, when we did those problems with the dielectric sphere, and actually for the conducting sphere as well, uh, because of the orthogonality of the Legendre polynomials, you're only going to have one surviving term from each of these possible infinite number ones, because all the others um, I have to be, will go to zero. So therefore, my interior solution is equal to A 
base of one into your R cosine theta, and then outside. We have minus B naught R cosine theta over mu naught plus cosine theta over r squared. I've got two, um, two equations, two unknowns. I've got the two equations for my two boundary conditions. And uh, all that remains to solve this problem is to apply those conditions to solve for the two unknown coefficients. And I'm going to have to erase a little bit of this to give myself some more room. Um, I find it more convenient to write the boundary conditions in this form um, <clears throat> since I know that B is equal to mu H is proportional to H in this case. Okay, and just as a reminder, gradient of some scalar functions for real coordinates. it off. It's partial derivative of the function with respect to r in the r direction plus 1 over r partial derivative of the scal uh, magnetic scalar potential with respect to theta in the theta direction plus 1 over r sine theta partial derivative of the magnetic scalar potential <coughs> with respect to phi in the phi direction. So your normal component in this case actually is in the radial direction. So therefore, first condition is that of the magnetic scalar potential with respect to R, and I should write this as a little less than, a little greater than here, at uh, evaluated at the surface of the sphere is equal to mu naught times partial derivative of the magnetic scalar potential with respect to R. And again, remember this is because H is equal to minus the gradient of the scalar potential and also the magnetic field is equal to um, permeability times H. Now inside, the permeability is just equal to mu of the material. Outside, it's just the magnetic permeability of free space. So basically, we're just setting uh, the radial component of this equal to the radial component of this. Okay, so let's do the math here. Uh, Left-hand side, we'll wind up with mu times a sub 1 less than cosine theta. On the right hand side we will wind up with minus b naught cosine theta. This mu naught will cancel out with this one. Uh, the other term will give us plus mu naught actually that will be minus 2 mu naught over r cubed c1 greater cosine theta. My second boundary condition, that is to say that the tangential component of the H field is continuous. minus a sub 1 less than sine theta is equal to, on the right hand side, minus b naught, actually it's going to be minus minus, so we'll have b naught sine theta over mu naught, 
plus or minus, minus C1 greater than sine theta over R cubed. Let's make sure there are no missing signs that crept in here somehow. To solve this, let's multiply, first of all, the bottom expression by mu, and then add the two equations up. So the left-hand sides of the equation will drop out, the right-hand side will give me zero, or the left-hand side will be zero, and it'll have minus b naught, let's just write that as b naught, um, mu over mu naught, minus one, and then over here, we will have minus Two mu naught plus mu times c1 greater than over r cubed. And solving for c1 greater than see for mu uh, over mu naught minus one all over two mu naught plus mu. Um, <clears throat> times b naught times r cubed. Now I'm going to solve for a sub 1. So in order to do that, if I multiply both sides by minus 2 u naught and I add them together, uh, these, these two terms will drop out and the left hand side I'll wind up with u plus 2 mu naught a1 plus that. And then over here, I will wind up with minus 3 b naught. And therefore, a1 less than is equal to minus 3 b naught over 2 mu naught plus mu. solution will therefore be minus 3b naught r cosine theta over 2 mu naught plus mu. And my exterior solution will be equal to minus b naught over mu naught r cosine theta plus B naught times mu over mu naught minus 1 plus 2 mu naught plus mu, or all over um, 2 mu naught plus mu, times the radius of the sphere cubed over r squared cosine theta. So it's generally speaking not just the scalar potential that I'm after, I'm really after the, the magnetic field. So inside 
that's equal to mu naught um, mu h inside, which is equal to minus mu gradient of the magnetic scale of potential inside. Uh, it's easier if you just think of this as um, z, so just do it in Cartesian coordinates. This is just going to give you 3 mu b naught over 2 mu naught plus mu in the z direction. So inside, our solution is uniform. Now, it's interesting to take a limit to see what happens in the case that your sphere just has a permeability of free space. It should collapse back down to your uh, uniform field, and that's exactly what you get. If you, uh, your sphere just had the permeability of free space, mu naught, you have 3 mu naught over 3 mu naught, which is just 1, and that's just going to be b naught z. So, so far, so good. Let's look at the exterior solution. Very far away, I know this has to have the value of b naught and in the z direction. The second term is going to take a little bit more effort to uh, to work out. And let me don't leave out a step here. This will be mu naught times h greater than and minus mu naught times the gradient of the magnetic um, scalar potential for the exterior solution. So when I do that, that's going to be b naught The exterior solution of the magnetic field is equal to b naught in the z direction, and as you can see, the second term does in fact go to zero, as r gets very, very large, so we will have um, satisfied the boundary condition that the magnetic field is uniform. The second term, I will read it out, is equal to minus u naught b naught times u mu over mu naught minus 1 over 2 mu naught plus mu uh, radius of the sphere cubed all over the radius of the observation point cubed minus 2 cosine theta in the radial direction, minus sine theta in the theta direction. So what happens if the sphere has permeability equal to mu naught? So in other words, it's just free space. We should, our answer should collapse um, to the proper value. The second term will go to zero, and you'll wind up with that inside and outside for the case where mu is equal to mu naught, it's just equal to b naught c. So that's basically the same thing as saying the sphere is not there. Okay, so that is problem number one. Um, if it feels like this is, even though we're the same tools, we're using the same tools as in electrostatics, um, it does have a sense, it feels a little bit slightly more complicated. And I think it has to do with, um, you know, these boundary conditions, how you have to um, apply these. It's just, it's just a little bit more work, just a little bit more. Okay, so that's the end of this problem. The next problem I'm going to work through has to do with calculating the magnetic field due to a uniformly magnetized sphere. Since 
there are no free currents, or another way of saying it, since there are no conventional currents, another way of saying that, no transported charge, I can write the H field as minus the gradient of some magnetic scaling potential. So what are the what are the boundary conditions in this case? Well, again, because there are no free currents, the tangential component of the H field is continuous. However, there's a discontinuity in the normal component of the H field, and that's equal to minus. discontinuity in the normal component of the magnetization. Because the divergence of the magnetization vanishes, and it's uniform, and we've taken it to point in the z-direction, therefore I can say that the magnetic scalar potential is a solution of Laplace's equation. And therefore, since we're dealing with a spherical problem, I can expand the solutions in the genre polynomials. The solution can't blow up at r equals zero, so therefore, that region of space will just be the summation L equals zero to infinity. A sub L are the LPL cosine theta. Generally speaking, for Laplace's equation, you also have terms in the form R to the minus L plus one. However, you can get rid of those because those are going to lead to um, infinities and I discard all those. Now for the exterior region, as a summation L equals zero to infinity, C sub L, R minus L plus one, PL cosine theta. Again, I discard those um, solutions corresponding to R to the L because my solution has to go to zero as R gets very, very large. Let's uh, calculate the boundary conditions here. In the first case, we're told that the tangential component has to remain continuous. So therefore, L equals zero to infinity, C sub L, R minus L plus one, one over R, partial derivative of the Legendre polynomial with respect to theta, not cosine theta, and that's equal to summation L equals zero to infinity, A sub L, R to the L, one over R, um, partial, or derivative of the Legendre polynomial with respect to theta. And when you take the gradient, you know, there is a minus sign that's in there, but since both terms have that, that just drops out. Okay, how about our second condition? And that is to say that there is a discontinuity in the normal component of the H field. So again, we're taking uh, H is equal to minus the gradient of the scalar potential, so we are four. going to have a minus L plus 1, but that is taken care of by that minus sign. And then we 
want to have the minus the um, normal component of the H field inside. So that's going to be minus, minus, we have plus. And then over the right hand side, um, that's not equal to zero. Um, you've got minus the discontinuity and the magnetization. Now the normal component of the magnetization is just equal to m dot r. It's in the radial direction. Normal component's in the radial direction. So therefore that's m naught z caret dot r caret. And that's just equal to m naught cosine theta. Let's consider the L equals zero term first. Okay, um, I'm taking the derivative of the Legendre polynomial with respect to theta. Now, the zeroth component, or zeroth order Legendre polynomial, is just equal to one. So if I take the derivative with respect to theta, that just is equal to zero. So what that means is um, for the L equals zero term, those are indeterminate because basically I've got something zero is equal to zero. That doesn't tell me anything. So therefore, we have C naught r to the minus 1 is equal to a naught, but um, beyond that I can't say anything, so I need to look at condition number 2 and see what that tells me about my zeroth order coefficients. First case I'll have a c, um, c naught. Second term vanishes because this is a sub l times l, which we're looking at l equals 0, so that term drops out, and then you just have um, and the n naught cosine theta on the right hand side. So therefore, c naught is equal to zero, and hence a naught equal to zero as well. Now let's consider the L equals 1 terms. What do you wind up with there? Well, in the first case, if I said L equal to 1, we wind up with C1, R to the minus 2. And then over on the right hand side, we have A1, R. And that tells me that A1 is equal to C1 over R cubed. Second condition, I have 2C1 r to the minus cubed plus A1 is equal to n naught. So solving both of these equations together, that C1 is equal to n naught r cubed over 3, and A1 is equal to n naught over 3. Substituting those back into our expansions, solution and not r cosine theta over 3 
and then the exterior solution in not R cubed over 3 R squared cosine data. Now, it's not the magnetic scale of potential that I'm ultimately after. I'm after the magnetic field. So let's calculate what H is first. Uh, the interior solution there is minus the gradient. In this case, this is just going to be equal to minus m naught over 3 in the z direction. Lo and behold, uh, each field is demagnetizing. It's in the opposite direction from the magnetization, and it's also uniform. Now, the exterior solution It is equal to n naught over 3 uh, raised to the sphere cubed over a little r cubed times 2 cosine theta in the r direction plus sine theta in the theta direction. And if I realize that m naught is in fact equal to little m over 4 pi over 3 r cubed. see that the H field outside is just the field due to a pure dipole. So inside, the H field is uniform and it's equal to minus one-third of the magnetization. Outside, it's just that due to a pure dipole. If I recognize that the magnetization is equal to, or write that as um, pure dipole moment over four pi thirds R cubed. Now if I want to write this in terms of the B field, Well, in the first case, um, the field is equal to it's equal to two thirds mu naught. Um, times m naught in the z direction. And then outside, the b field is just equal to mu naught times h. So basically, you just got another factor of mu naught in here. Okay? So that is the solution to a uniformly magnetized sphere. And got a uniform magnetic field inside and the field essentially due to a pure dipole outside. The third and final example that I'm going to work through today has to do with calculating the magnetic field due to a dipole, magnetic dipole, that's embedded at the center of a sphere of permeability mu. And of course, the radius is always r, unless you're told otherwise. So um, this problem meets the conditions for solving this using Laplace's equation. 
uh, the median in question is linear, so magnetic field is related to the H field, uh, let's see the mu H, and this is inside, outside, it's just equal to mu not H. Okay, so therefore we can immediately write down two, uh, the forms of the solutions. In the case of the exterior region, uh, the solution is of the form of summation L equals zero to infinity, sum coefficient CL, R and minus L plus one, PL cosine theta. Interior solution. It's going to have terms of uh, summation L equals zero to infinity, A sub L, R the L, P L cosine data. And here we discard all solutions corresponding to uh, the R and the L powers because you want your solution to go to zero as R goes to infinity. Over here, again, we're going to eliminate nearly all of these uh, solutions of this form. And we'll just have the R and the L terms left over. However, we do have the dipole placed at the center of the sphere. So therefore, The interior solution can be written as a um, superposition of the contribution from the dipole and the effect of the permeability of this material inside the sphere. Okay? So from the previous problem that we worked through, we actually found that if you had a uniformly magnetized sphere from the outside, it looked like a pure dipole. And so therefore we have the expression readily available to us for the scalar potential due to a um, pure dipole, so that's what we've got at the center of the sphere, so this is why, uh, where this term comes from. So instead of going through all of this, um, putting all the bells and whistles on and saying, well, we can discard whichever terms and so forth, I'm just going to immediately say, well, this is a cosine theta term. We know because of the uh, boundary conditions, only the cosine theta terms from each of these are going to survive. So. Again, the boundary conditions are that the tangential component of the H field is continuous across the boundary, and here it's convenient to write this as the um, normal component of the magnetic field is continuous across the boundary. And that's convenient because of the information that we're giving. We're not told what the magnetization, uh, not a, given a magnetization in this case we're told what the permeability is. So this is a more convenient form. Okay, so therefore I can erase all this stuff. I will have an A1 R cosine theta, and I will have a C1 cosine theta over R squared. And H is equal to minus the gradient of the scale of potential. I'm just going to write the two terms out so I don't lose track of anything. So this is minus partial derivative of the scalar potential with respect to r in the r direction plus 1 over r partial derivative of the scalar potential with respect to theta in the theta direction. Of course, I'm leaving off phi. Um, direction because there's no dependence on phi in this problem. Okay, so applying our two boundary conditions. In the first case, we have um, partial derivative with respect to theta that we need to take account of. So we get a minus sign from here. And then we have C1 sine theta and then minus sine because we're taking the derivative with respect to theta. That'll be over r cubed. And over 
the right hand side will have minus m uh, dipole moment, sine theta over 4 pi r cubed, and then last but not least, we will have minus a1 sine theta. Okay, so again, we're dividing all those terms through by a factor of r. And the upshot of this is that we'll have a1 plus m over 4 pi r cubed is equal to c1. Now, my second condition is that the normal component of the magnetic field is continuous. And so we need to have a factor of mu because remember, B is equal to mu times H, and it's mu inside, mu not outside. And so I got the outside terms first. Let's make sure I keep this straight. So we have minus mu not outside. times minus 2 cosine theta over r cubed. Right hand side half minus mu times 2 m cosine theta over 4 pi r cubed and again, we get a minus sign because we're taking the derivative with respect to r. And then for our a term, we have a1 cosine theta. So, um, doing the math here, second equation is minus mu a1 plus 2m mu over 4 pi r cubed is equal to 2c1 r cubed. Okay, two equations, two unknowns. Let's solve for c1 first. So what I can do is I can multiply this first equation through by mu and add it to this equation. So there are four, and I also left off mu dot up top, which is no good. Okay, so Write it over on the side here so I don't lose track of anything. signs or coefficients off. And of course I did. Okay. Now we're good to go. Multiply the first equation through by mu and add these two. So the A1 coefficients will drop out. side will be left with 3 mu over 4 pi r cubed. Over on the right hand side, we 
be left with um, mu plus 2 mu naught C1 over R cubed. And therefore, C1 is equal to 3 mu over 4 pi mu plus 2 mu naught. Now I can solve for A1, and I'll do that using the first equation. left with m over 4 pi r cubed, 2 times mu minus mu naught over mu plus 2 mu naught. So uh, let's make sure this has the proper behavior. So in other words, let's suppose uh, the permeability of the sphere is just equal to that of free space. Um, what will we be left with? Okay, if mu is equal to mu naught, then a1 vanishes, and we'll just have, for the interior solution, the magnetic field due to a dipole. Now, what about the exterior solution? If mu is equal to mu naught, we'll have basically 3 over 3. Uh, those will cancel out, and yes, you will have the right behavior um, in the limit as mu goes to mu naught. Okay, so let me write out my solution all the way. We have left sin. So I'm going to finish off the problem, and I will calculate the magnetic field inside of the sphere. I'll leave the exterior solution to you. So let me erase some of this. Then 
magnetic field is equal to minus mu times the gradient of the magnetic scale and potential. Okay, and that's your solution. So, as I said, it's a lengthy problem. Uh, very easy to lose track of minus signs or plus signs. 
So I will leave you with the calculation of the magnetic field outside. And in that case, remember, magnetic field outside is equal to mu naught times h instead of mu. Okay?